we're going to talk about something that's so shocking as to be unbelievable to some. Jews who collaborated with the Nazis during the 1930s and the start of World War II. I'm not talking about some nutcases, but the leaders of groups that eventually founded the State of Israel. Now, before you shake your head and turn the channel, listen to a headline from this week's Jerusalem Post. It's from September 23, 2009. It reads, When Zionists Made a Deal with the Nazis. It was written by historian Edwin Black himself, a Zionist, who has written a whole book about how Zionist organizations in the 30s broke the boycott against Germany and sold Nazi goods in Palestine. Coincidentally enough, Lenny Brenner, a historian who specializes in this period, has just released a paperback edition of his book 51 Documents, Zionist Collaboration with the Nazis. I interviewed him about it in New York City in August. You've written oh, three books that detail collaboration by major Zionist organization with Mussolini's fascists and Hitler's Nazis. Is that right? Yes. Uh, at that time, in other words, the Mussolini-Hitler period, uh, the Zionist movement was divided into from about 1931 on uh, into two rival organizations. W one was called the World Zionist Organization and the other one was called the Zionist Revisionist Movement. Okay, Now they merged sometime in the 50s uh, again and the Zion, the uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, his party, are the Likud party, are the direct descendants, as it were, of the Zionist revisionist movement of the 20s and 30s. Okay, now what Zionist revisionism stands for is this: in uh, if you if you look back at history. Uh, when the League of Nations gay, which was a, a pro-British organization, it was, I mean, set up by the British and the French, uh, when they gave Palestine to the British as a mandate, what they meant by Palestine was what we moderns call Palestine. In other words, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River and what we now call the Kingdom of Jordan, okay? But in 1922, the British took Jordan away from the so-called Jewish national homeland and gave it to the Hashemites who had gotten kicked out of Mecca by Ibn Saud, all right? Um, the World Zionist Organization leadership decided, look, there are no Jews in Jordan, so and, and not that many in what we call Palestine, so basically they're taking away what we don't have, so, you know, what we, what we can't use. So, okay, we're not going to make a big fuss about it. But Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was the founder of Zionist revisionism and one of the leaders at that time of the World Zionist Organization, he said, no, 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 no. You can't just let the British take away Jordan from the so-called Jewish national home because what that'll do is it'll convince the Arabs that, hey, we got them to give up, we got the British to give up Jordan to us. If we keep on fighting, we'll get them to give up the rest of Palestine. You got to say no, okay? You got to demand that the British revise their policy. So that's how they got the name Zionist Revisionist, okay? In other words, he understood in 1922 a central fact about Zionism, which is that it's, and he wrote an article about it, uh, called The Iron Wall, We and the, and the uh, Arabs, in which he said, look, let's 
tell it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, you know, but let's tell it like it is. We're a colonial movement, okay? Well, if you look at the history of, of colonialism anywhere in the world, the natives always fight the colonials, okay? And they keep fighting until it's impossible for them to win, like the Indians in the United States, you know, fought for, you know, two centuries and, and finally reconciled themselves when it was impossible for them to win. So we have to have an iron wall. What he meant was an iron wall of bayonets, okay, in order to build Zionism in Palestine. And we can't give up an inch. You know, I want to go back a step and, and get into a very basic thing because we never really clarified what is Zionism because some people say, well, Zionism, that's just Jews or what they believe in, and uh, I think we have to cover the distinction. Well, you know, it, Zionism is sort of hard to define because it has its, the Zionist movement has its idea, you know, and then the rest of us have, have our idea. Um, basically speaking, it was an invention uh, uh, Theodor Herzl, uh, uh, a uh, uh, Hungarian-Austrian uh, journalist, uh, decided that, look, uh, you have all this, anti uh, 1897, let's say, you have all this anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, it's going to go on until the Jews are smart enough to get out and go back to their homeland in uh, what we call Palestine, but, you know, what he would have called Judea, okay, or, you know, Israel is a later name for, for that, okay. Uh, obviously, the Jews come from Judea, if you, if you know what I mean, okay. Um, let's say in 1897, the average Jew in Russia, Tsarist Russia, or uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany, wherever, uh, most of them wanted to get their rights in their country, okay? If they didn't want to wait around until they got their rights from the Tsar or whatnot, they packed up and emigrated to the United States where they were more or less equal. You know, there no, was no legal discrimination against Jews, etc. But the Zionists had a third idea. And the Zionists had the third idea. Now, I mean, that's not unusual. You know, if you have millions of people, you have a lot of different ideas, okay? Uh, the problem, of course, was that, that uh, Judea or Palestine, whatever you want to call it, of course, was run by the, Turk, the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And uh, they weren't about to uh, hand over Palestine to, uh, to the Zionists or anybody else. But when uh, World War I broke out, the British decided, look, we need Jewish support worldwide and particularly in America uh, against the Germans who were allied to the Turks, okay? Uh, the problem that the British had in getting that support was that they were allied to Tsarist Russia, which was the most anti-Semitic country in the world. So the average uh, Jew was not interested in, you know, wishing Britain and Tsarist Russia to win any war, you know, if, if you follow me. But at any rate, after the war, the uh, British said, okay, uh, we'll establish the Jewish national home. Now. It, uh, aside from the fact that, you know, they had made the promise and they had to, you know, go through the motions of fulfilling their promise, they also figured, look, we got to run Palestine now that we have it, okay? We can't do it by ourselves. British imperialism was always based on using somebody in the country against the bulk of the natives. Like in India, they tended to back the Muslims against the Hindus. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm using that as an example. Or in Ireland, the Protestants against the Catholics. So they figured they would use the Zionists against the Arabs. Now, you're not the writer of this book. You're the editor. I'm why, the editor. Why did you feel that you had to make a book of documents? Because you did cover this subject in earlier books. Yes. Well, uh, let me put it this way. The, my um, 
attitude. I, I, I see myself as a political activist and as an, a historian, okay? And I based Zionism in the Age of the, uh, of the Dictators, which was my first book, on the documents, all right? And the documents are so overwhelming in their evidence of, of collaboration that I figured that the public you know, the, the average lay person, they, I mean, a lot of them were convinced by my book, but there's no doubt about the documents, you know. And, you know, this is what us historians do, okay? In fact, now what I'm trying to do is set up a website where uh, I would have the documents on the website and then another, you know, linked website where scholars would debate it and then another linked website where political people would debate the significance of the documents today. But the key is documents. How long did it take you to do this book? Well, this book was very quick because I had already had the documents for Zionism in the Age of the Dictators. I would say uh, what happened was that in uh, 19... 73, was it? Yes, when the, uh, you had the second Arab-Israeli war, okay? Uh, I was out in Berkeley, California, and, uh, you know, uh, we had won a free speech area in a famous battle in uh, Berkeley. And uh, so we were, me and a bunch of other anti-Zionists were, uh, you know, debating Zionists on the campus there. And I met a guy, uh, Shimshon Vigador, whose father was the editor of the Encyclopedia Judaica. And uh, I, I had read an article in the Judaica about a, a, uh, a thing called the Ha'avara Agreement. Ha'avara is Hebrew for the transfer, okay, which was a trade agreement between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933. So... Um, I asked him about it, and he said well, he had heard about Zionist collaboration, but he didn't know much about it. So I started doing the research then. Uh, but then I, ha I realized I had to get to New York where you had a real Jewish library. You know, I mean, Berkeley didn't. And uh, so I started doing more research in New York. And then I went to, by, by chance, I went to uh, Britain and... Uh, uh, went to Kroom Helm, which was one of the leading uh, publishing houses in Britain. They published the Berks Peerage, you say. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, I explained that I had, you know, all these documents, etc. And they said, look, uh, we'll publish it, but you got to show us every document. In other words, we won't tolerate the slightest mistake because what's, you're, you're going to write one of the most controversial books imaginable. Your enemies are going to go through your book with a magnifying glass, and they're going to blow up the slightest mistake. Okay, so there can be no mistakes. Okay, so I photocopied all the stuff, etc., you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And I, of course, kept all the document, you know, the photostatic stuff. So when I put this book out, I already had the, the documents. Uh, but it took me, uh, you know, about 10 years to accumulate it. But that's because I was in Berkeley for so long, you know, before I... Found most, I found most of the documents in the Jewish room in the New York Public Library. I, right. I, I go in through old Zionist publications and scholarly works and so on. All right, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to jump right into to some of the documents. One is uh, the Zionist Federation addresses the new German state. Yes. So I guess this is a couple months after Hitler is uh, chosen to be chancellor. And there's a sentence in there that says something like... Uh, the new state which has established the principle of race. We wish to fit our community into the structure. Yes. What they did was in uh, June 1933, Hitler came to power in January, January 30th, 1933. In June, they sent 
the Nazis uh, a document uh, which was published, wasn't published until 1963 in German in Israel. Okay? I found it and had it translated and so on, you know, all that kind of... Well, actually it was translated by uh, a... a uh, an American Jewish uh, Zionist historian, etc. But I found it and uh, pu pub quoted from it extensively in, in Zionism in the Age of the Dictators. And basically what they were saying is, hey, uh, hi Adolf, uh, you guys are uh, racist and uh, so are we, you know. Uh, uh, you know, group, that's the name, you know, the, the group, that's the thing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you want us out of here, and uh, we want Palestine, so uh, let's do a deal. And what they literally did was they worked out this agreement called the, the Haravara or transfer agreement. Right, so that's the next document I was going to ask about, the agreement for transferring property from Germany to Palestine. Okay, now any German, didn't matter whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, if you, in 1933, we're talking about the depths of the depression, okay, everybody's broke. I mean, governments are broke, you know. So if you wanted to take money out of Germany, no matter who you were, you got nicked at the border for like 25%, okay? So what the Zionists and the Nazis did was they worked out a deal where instead of sending the money out over the border, that a Jew would hand over, let's say, 100,000 Reichmarks. I'm just being arbitrary, you know. 100,000 Reichmarks to the Nazi government, and the Nazi government would then ship 80,000 Reichmarks worth of, let's say, steel pipes to Palestine, where the Zionists would then sell the pipes to themselves, to the Arabs, whoever they could, and then give the money to the emigre Jew when he arrived in Palestine. So it was cheaper for the uh, Jew to uh, to go out that way, than to get nicked by for more money going to New York. Well, that sign sounds nice, but weren't other Jews then demanding that people not buy any German yes, product? Of course, what this meant was that the Zionist movement was breaking the what you might call the automatic, spontaneous boycott of German goods by Jews all over the world. They actually were selling things like steel pipes and stuff like, you know, whatever the Germans shipped them, they were selling them all over the Middle East. And they even tried to sell them in Europe, but like the British Zionists said, listen, don't, don't, don't try to do it here. I mean, that will just create problems. You know, people will wonder what the hell's going on, you know. But they were selling the goods all over the Middle East. Zionists said, listen, don't, don't, don't try to do it here. I mean, that will just create problems. You know, people will wonder what the hell's going on, you know. But they were selling the goods all over the Middle East, okay? Now, to make matters worse, in 1937, the Haganah, which was the underground militia of the labor Zionists, who were the dominant element in the World Zionist Organization, sent a guy by the name of Fievel Polkus to Berlin to negotiate over the Haravara with the Nazis. And, he nego and as it happened, the Nazi who was assigned to negotiate with him was Adolf Eichmann, okay, who... I, I, who later transports millions of oh, Jews yeah, to their yeah, death. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, he's, he's the, the, he, he is Mr. Holocaust, so to speak. Okay. But at any rate, what happened was that Polkus invited Eichmann to Palestine to visit the Zionist kibbutzes, etc., etc. So he gets to Palestine. He's there for a day when the British realize, who is this guy? 
you know, and they kick him out. Okay, so he and Polkus go to Cairo, and again they ne start negotiating. Now, what Polkus told him was, "Look, if you make." the Haravara transfer agreement even more favorable to us, I'll spy for you. For I'll try to locate oil in the Middle East for you. Now we know this because Eichmann, being a good German bureaucrat, he wrote it up. And after World War II, the Americans, when they captured Germany, found the documents. Now, there's a lovely detail. This is fantastic, but I want to move along. Sure. Isn't there a medal in there somewhere? Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, well, the medal is from a slightly earlier period. Eichmann worked for a guy uh, uh, that the SS had a, a specific, quote, Jewish office. In other words, an office that specialized in messing over the Jews, okay? And the guy in charge of it was a guy named Baron Itzelder von Mildenstein, all right? So in 1933, the Zionists invited von Mildenstein to Palestine, and he was there as their guest for about six months, and then he went back to Germany and wrote up his visit in uh, De Angriff, which was the SS, the leading SS propaganda journal, and they actually made a medal about the size of a silver dollar with a swastika on one side and a Star of David on the other. Yeah, okay, as a commemoration of von Mildenstein's visit to Palestine. Now, Eichmann, as I say, he went to Palestine in 1937. He started as von Mildenstein's disciple. And von Mildenstein had Eichmann learn Hebrew. Okay? Now, whenever I tell that to Jews, most of them burst out laughing because the one thing about Judaism that is least popular among Jews is having to learn Hebrew. You understand? So the idea of Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, studying Hebrew sounds like a joke, you know, except that it was real. I mean, we have some stunning stuff here, breaking the boycott against uh, Hitler, bringing uh, von Mildenstein, bringing Eichmann. I uh, want to talk now about Hitler's buddy, Mussolini. Okay. Uh, what kind of relations did some Zionists have with All him? Right. Okay, now... Uh, Mussolini, his image was that he wanted to recreate the Roman Empire, okay, in the Mediterranean. So he saw Britain as a rival, because, you know, Britain ran uh, Britain and France as his rivals, because they had Palestine, uh, the British had Palestine and Egypt, the French had Syria and Lebanon, and uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, etc. So, you know, he became their enemy, all right? Now, as I said before, when uh, Jabotinsky, the founder of Zionist revisionism, he wanted the Zionists to revise, to demand that the British revise their policy, and the Zionist, the World Zionist Organization wouldn't do it. So he decided to go looking for another mandatory to take over from Britain in Palestine, all right? Well, who was the only one who was even, could even possibly do that was Mussolini in Italy, okay? Now, Jabotinsky's first attitude, uh, uh, you have to understand something about Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky was one of the world's leading linguists and he had lived in Italy for three years, and he spoke letter-perfect Italian, okay? Italians couldn't believe that he wasn't Italian, all right? He was so enthusiastic for the, for the Italy before Mussolini that when Mussolini came to power, he didn't like him, and he called him the head buffalo, okay? 
you know, leading the, the rest of the Buffaloes. But he needed somebody to replace the British who were getting soft on the Arabs, all right? So he became more and more pro-Italian. And finally, in 1935, Mussolini invited Jabotinsky's youth group called Betar and had them, had cadets from Batar trained at Mussolini's Naval Academy. Okay, that's the equivalent of Annapolis in the United States, all right? And what literally happened was that they, they had about, over a period of about a year or so, 130 guys trained on ships and so on by Mussolini. I don't mean, and they literally, Mussolini came, when they, when they opened up their squadron at his academy, he came, you know, as a sign of, you know, his friendship, etc. and they wrote it up, and their report on their uh, squadron at, at Civita Vecchia is in the book. And who is the political heirs in modern Israel to uh, Jabotinsky's uh, people? Literally, Net Bibi Benj Binyamin, that's the Hebrew for Benjamin, Bibi Netanyahu, his father, Netanyahu's father, was Vladimir Jabotinsky's secretary. Okay, so in other words, this ain't no secret, you know, he can't say, I didn't know, you know, okay? Let's put it this way. They were so pro-fascist that at least 35 of them actually joined the Mussolini's university student group. In other words, they weren't just pro-fascist, they joined the Italian fascist party. That's how fascist they were. Now, um, they're... And all the while, uh, Mussolini is, is ravaging Ethiopia. And so now, a, while the war was going on in Ethiopia, the Zionist revisionist movement, that's Netanyahu's father's movement, I, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing this now, they marched in parades, they collected tin cans to be used, you know, uh, you know, when I say tin, I mean, you know, metal cans to be used during the war. I, I, this sounds strange to us, but the same thing went on in America during World War II. I mean, I remember collecting cans for, as a kid for the American government during World War II. You know, and these are guys were collecting for the other side. For, they were collecting for Mussolini. Yeah, and they marched in his victory parades. Now, I have in the book a report uh, in a uh, British uh, Zionist publication where they talked about how a Romanian magazine interviewed the financial director of the Zionist revisionist movement and he said that he was pro-fascist and that he, the financial director of the movement, supported the victory of Mussolini in Ethiopia as a victory of the white race over the black. Now, when I was writing my book, I interviewed several old Zionist revisionists and ex-Zionist revisionists. And one of them said that not only was he pro-fascist in that period, you know, the guy that I interviewed, but his estimate was that 70% of the Zionist revisionists in the 30s called themselves fascists publicly. And not only did they call themselves fascists, but Mussolini gave an interview to uh, a, a uh, Italian rabbi in which he called Jabotinsky your fascist Jabotinsky, okay? Von Mildenstein, 
the Nazi who went to first to Palestine, he describes on the boat that, you know, because he went from Italy, you know, that, that's the way you used to do it in the good old days. You know, you would go to Italy and then take a boat to Palestine. He described seeing some revisionists on the boat, and he described them as the Jewish fascists, okay? David Ben-Gurion, who at that time was the leader of the labor Zionist movement and later became the first prime minister of uh, uh, um, Israel, used to call Jabotinsky Vladimir Hitler. Okay, so now, you know, when Mussolini, oh, and Einstein in 1948, when Menachem Begin came to the United States, had a letter in the New York Times, okay, him and about 35 other, you know, prominent Jews, saying Begin's uh, movement is closely related to the Nazi and fascist movement. Now, uh, what I tell people is, look, when Einstein and Jabotin, uh, Einstein and Mussolini and the Nazis and the head of the Labor Party all say you're a fascist, there ain't no doubt about it. Everything was hunky-dory. Here they were marching around in, you know, in, in Mussolini's Naval Academy, et cetera, et cetera until 1936, and then all of a sudden the Spanish Civil War breaks out, okay? And Mussolini looks at Spain and he realizes, uh-oh, if the workers, the left wing, wins in Spain, that will inspire my workers to try to overthrow me. So I, they can't win in Spain. But Italy wasn't strong enough by itself to help Franco win the Spanish Civil War. So he had to ally himself with Hitler, okay? Now, up until that time, Mussolini said, look, I don't want to hear about this guy Hitler. You know, he, he, I hear all these guys, they, they want to be fascists. No, no, fascism is Italian, okay? But now he realized he had to ally himself to Hitler, and he realized if you ally yourself to Hitler, you can't have Jews at your Naval Academy. You can't have Jews in the fascist party. So he kicked all the Jews who were in the fascist party out of the party. He kicked the Zionist revisionists out of Civita Vecchia. And he put in discriminatory racial laws in Italy. So at that point, the Zionist revisionists got kicked out of Italy. But then... And Jabotinsky decided, well, you know, okay, that's over. So he went back to supporting the British. But the problem was, or not the problem, but what happened was so many of his guys had become, of his followers had become ideological fascists that they couldn't accept the fact that Mussolini had broken with them. They blamed it on the Jews. Here's Mussolini, he's being nice to us, et cetera, et cetera. And the Jews, those ingrates, they were always going on and ranting about fascism, okay? So what he did, what, what, what happened was that a wing of the Zionist revisionist movement, when World War II broke out, they broke with Jabotinsky they called themselves, the, they were called by everybody, the Stern Gang, after their leader, Abraham Stern, and they sent a message. Okay, I'm going to get into that in the okay. next question. Let me give a Good. question here. All right, so, so here we are. World War II is starting. Doesn't sound like these guys have learned their lesson. So, so where do some of them go even further with this okay. fascism? What happened was that this guy, Abraham Stern, uh, set up his own organization, a split, you know, that's common in all political groups, and they sent a message, uh, you know, a document by messenger to the Nazi, a Nazi diplomat in Beirut, which you have to understand, uh, your, your, uh, your viewers have to understand, in 19, by, 19, by that point in 1940, the Germans had conquered France. So 
France was run by a pro-Nazi regime called the Vichy French, okay? And they controlled Lebanon and Syria. So the Nazis had a diplomat in Beirut, okay? So the Stern Gang, which was the British name for them, the Stern Gang sent a messenger with this document to the Nazis offering to go to war on Hitler's side. They explained. Wait, 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 say that again. Okay. <laughs> the Stern Gang sent a message to, you know, a document, you know, hand delivered the document to a German diplomat in Beirut offering to go to war on Adolf Hitler's side. In other words, what year is it? 19, well, the first time they did it was in 19, they wrote it in 1940, it was actually delivered in, let's say, January 1941, okay? Then, when they didn't get a response from the Nazis, you know, I mean, they, they said, thank you very much, but they, you know, put it in their pocket, so to speak. They sent, they sent another messenger in, at the end of 1941, so it was, it was delivered twice, okay? After World War II, the document was found by the British in Turkey, in the German embassy in Turkey. In other words, the diplomat, who they had given it to in Beirut, he toured the Middle East, and, and when he got to Turkey, he deposited the document in the German embassy in Turkey. So, so let me emphasize this. We're in World War II, in the middle of the actual Holocaust, and this group of Zionists is proposing to fight on the side of Adolf Hitler. Absolutely. Uh, to show you how everybody identified them with the fascists, the Zionist revisionists with the fascists, when, in 1943, when the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising took place, the main group that did the fighting okay, refused to permit Betar, the youth group of the Zionist revisionists, to join their organization because the main resistance group was consciously anti-fascist. And their attitude was, no, we don't have, we don't have Jewish fascists in our group. As crazy as all this sounds, you know, fascists trying to go to war on Hitler's side, etc. About five years ago, Moshe Arens, who had later became, who be, was, is a former uh, foreign minister and defense minister of the Israeli government, actually wrote an article which I found in the New York Sun, okay, you know, a daily newspaper, saying, look, isn't it time to forget about the fact, you know, that we were pro-fascist, et cetera, and, you know, I know you guys used to say we were fascists and all that, you know, but it's time to drop it. You know, well, you know, look, you've heard of, of Holocaust revisionism, you know, like, uh, 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 I mean, in Nejad, in uh, Iran, etc., you know, uh, ah, it was only a million Jews who were killed, you know, that kind of stuff. Calling for a former defense minister of Israel to tell people that you shouldn't call us fascists anymore, that's Zionist Holocaust denial. Let me go into one more document. It's a, it's a Rezo Kostner, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, the report of the Budapest Jewish Rescue Committee. What was that about? Okay. Uh, now, again, as I emphasize, uh, Eichmann had gone to Palestine as the guest of the Labour Zionists in 1937 and spoke Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. When Germany got into Hungary. Uh, Hungary was an ally of Germany during uh, the, the reactionary regime, was an ally of Germany during World War, II, uh, World War II. One of the first things that he did was he went to Rishu Kasna, who was one of the labor Zionist leaders in Hungary, 
and said, okay, let's do a deal. Because, you know, I mean, he, he knew from experience that labor Zionists would do this kind of a deal. And what he did was he said, look, I'm, you send one of your guys, I'll let you send one of your guys from Hungary to Istanbul in Turkey to negotiate with the Zionist movement there, and, you know, with the, the Zionists in Palestine and the British and the Americans. What I want is for the British and Americans to give us, the Germans, 10,000 trucks, which we'll only use against the Soviets, in return for which you can have all the Jews in Hungary. Now, I mean, this is absurd. I mean, you know, in other words, when the British heard about it, they said, throw that right in the garbage. You know, they were not about, I mean, they're allied to the Soviet Union, you know. They're not about to do this. But the deal to, you know, that to make all this sound sweet to Kastner, who, he's, who Eichmann is negotiating with, what he did was he said, look, right now I'll let you send a train load of Jews to Switzerland to show that I'm not playing a game with you, okay? So he sent about 2,000 Jews, Kostner sent about, he picked 2,000 Jews and sent them to Switzerland, okay? After the war, he wrote up the whole episode in a thing called the Berecht in German, because understand, nobody speaks Magyar, the Hungarian language, except Hungarians, okay? And he didn't speak English, so he wrote it in German. And it was sent, you know, it was, pub uh, it was you know, put in the archives in, uh, in uh, Israel. But then what happened was that a Hungarian Jew accused Kastner of collaborating with the Nazis in Israel. You know it, why? What? What's? What would be bad about bringing two thousand Jews to Switzerland? It, well, in return for which Kastner didn't tell the other Jews that the, the other trains were going to Auschwitz. You get my point, all right? So, one of the Jews who managed somehow to survive, when he got to Israel and he discovered Kastner was there, he wrote an article in a Hunga in a Magyar you know Magyar language newspaper accusing Kastner of collaborating and Kastner got the Israeli government to sue the guy for libel okay on his behalf only it turned into a disaster and the judge at the at, in the hearing said you know after after you know a trial no, he, he, yeah, he collaborated, for sure, okay? What then happened was Kastner appealed the verdict against him, all right? While it was still before the court, in other words, before the High Court of Israel ruled on the appeal, Kastner was assassinated by a rival Zionist group, by Zionist revisionists, no less, okay? And... But since he was assassinated, the Israeli Supreme Court felt we have to be fair to him and review the case as if he were alive. So they ruled that technically he was not a collaborator because there was no def he didn't violate any rule or law, you know, defining what a collaborator was. But this is the same court, in the same decision, he was guilty of writing an affidavit on behalf of one of the Nazis in Eichmann's group there when the guy was put on trial at Nuremberg. Let me go back a step. The big thing was he was doing, he's, he's rescuing a thousand, two thousand people but he's he's not telling or warning the others. Right. Well, if they had been warned, would it have made a difference? Yes, because by that time it was obvious that Germany was going to lose the war, which meant that there were all kinds of people in Hungary who who would who would have said, "Sure, you can hang, you know, Harry, you can hang out in my house." I mean, that kind of thing went on all over Europe. 
you know, and, and particularly since the Hungarian government wasn't popular, you know, there were a lot of Hungarians who would have done it. Now, I'm not saying that all of the Jews would have been saved, you know. How many people, how many Hungarian Jews perished, approximately? Well, let's say 400,000, but I mean, you know, don't hold me to the exact number, but hundreds of thousands, okay? They were the last major group to be shipped over there to, to uh, Poland. All right, look, my last couple questions. Let's play, let's say, devil's advocate. If you were going to write a book, Zionist fights against the Nazis in the 30s and 40s, what would you have written about? One of the things that I say in defense of my book, Zionism in the Age of the Dictators and 51 Documents, is exactly that. Where's the Zionist book on how they fought the Nazis. The only thing that the Zionists did in the way of fighting the Nazis was about 1943 the British army organized about 5,000 Zionists from Palestine into a Jewish unit of the British army and they fought in the British army in Italy. Okay. Now it, re, it, it uh, you know, they must have fought the, the the Germans at some point, but the British were very reluctant to use them because they figured, listen, if the Nazis realize that this unit is Jew, all Jews, they'll go after them more than you know after us, and they would they wouldn't do us any good. So you know they were there, but that's it. That amounts to it. Now. Individual Zionists, of course, fought in the American army, the British army, whatever, and the actual leader of the organization that in the Warsaw Ghetto that combined the labor Zionists, the communists, and the, the Bund, which was a Yiddish socialist organization, was a labor Zionist named Mordechai Anyalevich. An An so, you know, individual Zionists fought, okay?